Cool. Um, and and I'm realizing that uh, we should probably do a, a reset on Fellowship of the Link and figure out where we are and what we're interested in. And Pete, it sounds like you had a nice chat with Chris last week. Uh, it was you and Chris. Uh, yes. Um, did you talk about those kinds of things? Like what is fellowship or? Mm, eh? No, we talked about some specific, um, some specific things. I'm, I forget what, but cool. it was fun. Cool. Um, and it feels like there's a whole bunch of things going on out there that we should maybe corral into, uh, what we care about and see how that remix affects our own conversations and so forth. So. Um, it'd be nice to have Chris and, and SJ here and a couple others. So, hmm. hmm, we can cruise into it. Yeah. I will right. note real quick. I will have to drop a quarter to the next hour. Sounds the fine. Five minute point. Yep. Cool. Um, I learned about micro dot blog from Chris last week. What's micro oh, yeah. blog? So it's like very popular in the, um, Indie web community because it's fully integrated with micro formats and indie auth, which are both like big things. And um, it's also um, it's also got ActivityPub. Okay. Yeah, that's much more recent. Um, they did yeah. that recently, but yeah, it's very cool. I mean, I feel like part of the indie web thing is self-hosting, so I'm not quite sure I understand, but. <laughs> If people like using it, people like using it. I can't object. Have more social networks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the thing I was looking for, and it, it might fit the bill, uh, is an, uh, I, actually what I was looking for was an email newsletter, something that's not Substack or Ghost. Mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't even really, really thinking it could be microblogging too, but I think they do. Um, uh, I think they do uh, email as well as everything else. That micro.blog has email? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Because it seems like just posting stuff someplace and then pretending it's a mailing list, pretending it's a wiki, pretending it's whatever else is the way to go. Yep. Like just put the file someplace and then do things with it and to it. Yep. Um, I wonder if it's microblog. Maybe it's something else because I don't. Microblog is looking like a plain old blogging hosting service. It doesn't uh, doesn't smell very different. Um, so the the cool thing is it's it's kind of like a little Twitter. Um, it's a it's a social network, but it's also independent. They can be independent. Um, yeah, it, it uses the. Um, Micro, the uh, micro formats contact will allow you to syndicate things to it really easily. Mm -hmm. So it's more Mastodon y? Sort of? Uh, so I guess let, it, it works with ActivityPub, but I think the idea is more that, once again, because the indie web community is very into self hosting, it's more about the idea that like individual self hosted entities can syndicate to it and use it like a social network through that interaction. Mm -hmm. it, somebody can subscribe to your microblog like it was a Mastodon account, I think. Yeah, yeah. And and it is, this microblog is what I was thinking of um, from Mr. Manton. Um, so it also has email subscription. Yeah, I will say a lot of people are a fan of button down for email i haven't yeah. used it yeah but that's also one thank you i appreciate it um i made a list and button down was definitely on it and yeah. it's pretty good here's my here's my list of newsletter publishing platforms right now I also have in my list, I've got Paragraph and Newsletter Glue, which is a WordPress plugin. Hmm. So done with WordPress. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I've got a whole I'm... bunch of WordPress blogs I have to go like shoot in the head because I keep getting update messages from 
a service that was hosting them was like, we've updated your PHP server. I'm like, I don't want those anymore. They're dead. Yeah, I'm interested. What uh, has turned you off of WordPress? So I tried hard for more than a dozen years to love WordPress. I built uh, my, I had a business site for the relationship economy expedition that I built on WordPress and I hired a web mistress to run, to build me a little bit of custom code, um, which she did and it worked for a while. Then um, I got hacked and somebody owned that domain and I had to fight to sort of win it back. And then I had to pay a company called Sukuri, which does WordPress site protection. I basically had to pay them almost like ransom to protect the site because I was self-hosting and didn't have the chops to do my own security. And I was paying them more than I was paying Greenhost to host a variety of other sites and do a bunch of other work. I was like, that was really irritating. Then I went to try to change my website and it turned out my webmistress had gone upscale and was like, I only do retainers now. And her rate had gone way up. And I was like, I don't have retainer kind of business for you. So then her chunk of code basically blew up and didn't work anymore. So I just went and rebuilt the room, I, I, I built a way worse version of the site on Google Sites, which is my go-to. And I figure if I'm on Google Sites, they're not going to let themselves be hacked, which has been true so far. I've had no trouble there. And then, and then I tried for years with sundry plugins and themes and other kinds of things to make WordPress do things I wanted it to do. And it never did. And I always had trouble placing images and making images do what I wanted in the, in the flow of text and all that. that they never seemed to fix that. And I was like, I'm done. I'm spent. It's over. My love affair with WordPress is done. So that was it. And it was me trying to fend for myself in WordPress in a sense that probably did me in, but but the ecosystem wasn't working for me. Yeah, yeah, that's legit. Um, I don't know. I, I also have sort of, uh, to be clear, I spent like probably almost ooh, five, eight years being primarily sort of like your webmistress, a WordPress developer for hire. Yep. Um, so I was able to make WordPress do a lot of things for me. And I still have WordPress sites I use in very abnormal ways. Um, but my my problem has more been the the intended user for WordPress, I think, has shifted. And I, I don't really like dislike WordPress for this. It's just the reality of what WordPress is, is at one point it was a blogging tool and now it is a corporate website slash large media company tool. Mm -hmm. um, and that's fine. It is what it is. And, you know, if I was a medium to large media company, I'd probably use WordPress. Mm -hmm. But the affordances that they have built for um, for making it work for that type of user make it much less friendly from a user perspective to be a single person blogger. Makes total uh, sense. I have a site I use to build like my personal archive that has a press forward, which is a tool I helped build that's WordPress based. I write nothing in that site. It's literally just an archiving tool. Great for that. I have some old sites I keep up to date. I have a site that is an aggregator of my content that works automatically. Mm -hmm. um, that's in desperate need of an update because the theme I used um, no longer works. And if I try to change anything on that site, it crashes. Oh. Um, and I have to go in and like wipe out the theme and rebuild the site. And that's like, it's just too much work that I don't want to deal with. So yeah. I'm trying to figure out like maybe some alternatives, which is why almost all of the things I build now are static sites generated on github.io domains that I can map domains to. So it's interesting. just so much simpler and so unhackable. Like the only point of failure there is my GitHub account and that's been secured 20 ways to Sunday and I can run 20 sites, 50 sites, a hundred sites off of there. It's just, yeah, it frustrates me because there are a lot of things that WordPress is good at that I would like to apply elsewhere, mm -hmm. but the difficulty of just writing in it has raised significantly to the point that I am frustrated by it. Wow. 
Wow. Uh, and Pete, you didn't really dabble much in WordPress, did you? But the rest of the rest of I've our journey sounds similar to, similar to I, your, your conclusions. Yeah, I, I I did have I've done a fair bit with WordPress, hosting WordPress actually for other oh, people. Oh, okay. Um, and it's yeah. I wish I was smart enough to have uh, retainer arrangements with my clients, but then I would need paying clients and yeah. And actually, WordPress is it's crazy making. Um, you have to really stay on top of the the security stuff. Yeah, yeah, it was bad. It's, uh, Aaron speaking like as as a, as a uh, you know as a tool for medium sized companies. <clears throat> it's it reminds me a little bit of uh, MediaWiki as a wiki engine. You know, it's it's got a lot of capability, and it's a heavy lift to keep it going. Yeah, I mean, if you have the time and the engineering capability to regularly invest into your WordPress instance. Just like with MediaWiki, you can do a lot, but I would much rather spend time building new things than doing boring maintenance work on old things. So an amateur question, um, have those two platforms become sort of the modern Outlook server, um, which basically like you needed a full-time admin to run a stupid Outlook server because Outlook was originally an X400, X500 server, which they terribly repurposed to be an, uh, an internet mail server. And it had all this crusty stuff that was like hard to maintain. And so anytime I ran into somebody who was like on Outlook, I was like, I'm so sorry. Um, it, ha have these two platforms that used to be like interesting and fun become the same thing? And is that an inevitable consequence of serving corporate clients and getting bigger and getting older? Or is this in, just in poor engineering? Case, it's, it's serving Wikipedia, uh, all the Wikipedias. So it's, you know, it's not necessarily a business thing. Yeah, it is a scale true. thing. Yeah, Wikimedia is very definitely not a business platform, but yeah, it is a it's, scale thing. It's a scale thing, yeah, and and yeah. you know some weird weird path dependence too, because they could have gone, they could have scaled differently. Yeah, your, your question reminds me, mm. um, it's it's a it's a interesting and partially fair question and partly unfair question. Um, it's they're not like Outlook. Um, it reminds me of when I asked ChatGPT, uh, as as one does. Um, compare and contrast uh, the uh, all the Disney characters with the uh, Indian gods and goddesses. Oh my God! And well it, done. It's like, it's like, yeah, I could compare those for you, and they have some of the similar, you know, kind of. But yeah, no, don't. It's not really fair. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the thing is, the more like sort of significant question it is, is the fate of all successful open source tools to become enterprise software. Uh, I, I don't think that's necessarily the case. It's about the intent of the maintainers and the intent of the users and the intent of the community. Mm -hmm. um, I think the thing about WordPress is like, it's actually really interesting because one could argue that like Automatic steered it in this direction, but I wouldn't say so actually. Automatic in my experience, and. I actually have code in WordPress core. So like mm -hmm. in my experience, automatic is very hands off. This is sort of the outcome of the people who live and work in WordPress also living and working in, you know, capitalism, which is to say <laughs> they need to make money and they want to make the most amount of money. And therefore, if you are a community of people who are building this tool for hire, both in terms of as users and as developers, but also as contributors, because a lot of contributors to WordPress in the same way that has happened with Linux are paid by a company to contribute to WordPress, right? right? So because of that, it's inevitably going to turn towards the needs of enterprise because that's who can afford to contribute to it. And because the project is not particularly focused on any other intent. Whereas, like, could that happen with Ghost? It seems less likely because the intent of the project has always been small. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a different set of outcomes that are expected of contributors than WordPress, where it's just the only requirement is better. And the definition of better is according to the, according to the people who contribute. Um, that's why I'm not angry about it. Like, 
it, WordPress developed the way that it developed because that's how things develop um, in general, unless you make a very strong intent otherwise. Yeah. Certainly, I made a career off of developing WordPress for almost a decade. Wow. And that probably would not be possible if I had done just Ghost. Not that Ghost was a thing, but I couldn't imagine doing that with just Ghost now, right? Like, that is what it is. Um, and other people were doing like, what you did on Drupal or on the other major platforms of the time, or if they were in education on what was it called? Moomba? No. Yeah, there was a Moomba. There yeah. was a there was a replacement to Moomba also that I can't remember the name of. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, because I were worked kind of major. Moomba. There were some of these major platforms in different areas that people adopted and got good at, but they were all hard to use. Is there also like an information architect, um, strategic software development question here about how do you scale and how migration actually winds up working? I, I think maybe but i i i would i would contribute something different yeah. um, I, I like aram's uh, analysis it makes a lot of sense another thing is that wordpress despite being you know uh groundbreakingly simple um uh has always been a little bit hard to use uh so it's not quite a muggle friendly tool mm -hmm. uh, even though muggles were using it so you mm -hmm. had to have a layer of of you know insulation people um or translation people or whatever you know you needed infrastructure people to be able to run the wordpress and so that that was the foot in the door kind of for turning that into an, an industry um uh if you were able to run it yourself ghost you can run yourself i think nowadays pretty much um uh maybe that's not true but it but anyway it, it was just complicated enough that you a sole proprietor blogger was probably not going to be running WordPress by themselves. Mm -hmm. They needed, you know, help. And then that turned into part-time paid help and then full-time paid help. And then the, the, along with that, um, the, the plugin marketplace and the theme marketplace, I think was a huge uh, thing. So as soon as you started having a theme marketplace and um, it's always been the themes and markets and themes and plugins have always had, free and paid which is great but as soon as you have free themes and 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 or sorry paid themes and paid plugins those are people's livelihoods right so they're going to drive it you know up the complexity curve and up the price curve and up the and also try to keep their special sauce features out of the core code if they can well, a, a good a good developer will do a mix, right? They'll do loss leader features into the core code, and then they'll do premium features into their proprietary stuff. Which gives you platypus. <laughs> and yeah, in a way, yeah, it's a way to you know WordPress is platypusy like that, um, and yeah. it's good, right? Because then you've got people making money off of, and, and this is kind of a virtuous open source cycle in in general. You know, you want people making money on open source. And shedding, you know, good kind of uh, generic things right. to the rest of the community, um, because if they weren't making a living doing it, they wouldn't be able to be donating the free stuff. So it's virtuous. Yep. Yeah, and I think the other reason, like as somebody who worked with Drupal as well, that WordPress won out sort of amongst these other um, CMS platforms, like very clearly at this point. I think their latest stat puts them at like 40% of all websites um, is that they have very, they have the advantage that the foundation is not just the automatic WordPress foundation is not just hands off, but has a clear source of revenue through hosting and leverages that revenue to, um, run events and sponsor people and have like yeah. a lot of collaborations and more than anything else, what it valued that no other open source project succeeded at valuing in my opinion was documentation hmm. where the automatic foundation paid for professional technical writers to write documentation and made it public and well Put together and clear to read and um like well seo'd um and that was a huge advantage for 
not just attracting users, but also developers, which is the other thing that you need for a success. Uh, Drupal and a lot of these other tools, Jambla was one, um, Text Pattern was another, um, a bunch of these, right? They're just, they are very poorly documented. Um, and when that happens, the inevitable developer brain disease comes in where they're like, why are you asking questions? Shouldn't you just know the, the answer is in the code? And then nobody wants to contribute to that community because it comes off like assholes. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Automatic and WordPress are, are not only developer friendly, but developer community friendly. Mm -hmm. So they've always yeah. been a huge, you know, builder of the community around around it. Unlike yeah, it, almost anything else. Yeah. The, nobody else really does it like that. And they've leveraged that really effectively for WordPress and for their WordPress VIP business and for buying Tumblr. This is such a great move by them. Um, and that they were smart enough to understand that from their experience, the value for these things does not come out of the tool. It comes out of the community. Um, and as long as they invest their time in encouraging the community, the tool will improve, um, one way or another. So interesting. So why did Tumblr die? How did they kill Tumblr? What? Broke with no, them. Tumblr died because Yahoo owned it and Yahoo kills everything. Oh, yes, yeah, true. And after Yahoo killed it, after having paid billions of dollars for it, um, Automatic's like, we'll take it off your hands. And it's been improving, not just as a platform, but the amount of activity on it has been improving and traffic from it has been increasing to other sites. So, which is an indication of a healthy network. So interesting. So under Tumblr in my brain, I've got an article from the New York Times, Yahoo to buy Tumblr for 1.1 billion. Uh, then I have automatic buys Tumblr and then in parentheses for 3 million question mark. Wow. Yeah, they were very little because wow. Yahoo this is what Yahoo did. Damn. Now it no longer fully exists, but that's what it does. It just kills things. It's There's very that. bad. <laughs> Yeah, like like Flickr is another good example. Yeah, yeah, and like, delicious. What an opportunity! Delicious too. Delicious. Two opportunities that could have made them a ton of money if they they bought up were a, not really they bought up a at. bunch of good companies, and then managed to kill most of them. Yep, um, they killed. They bought up a bunch of ad tech companies and killed those too. Yeah, so they're not even good at making money on the things that are supposed to make money for them. They bought uh, Ink to Me, GeoCities, Flurry, Alta Vista. <clears throat> Broadcast.com, uh, Delicious, DocsPad, eGroups. Oh, that's right, eGroups. Uh, <laughs> via, via web, upcoming.org. Remember upcoming? Yeah, upcoming yeah. is the one that, that, that. Yep. Kill them all. Boom. Kill them all. There's a great article uh, about this on, like, I think it was Gizmodo. That talks about like, I'll have to hunt it down. I think it's in my Pinterest uh, pin board um, where it talks about like how Yahoo just like is designed to kill everything. <laughs> I'd love to see that. Yeah, here it is. How Yahoo killed Flickr and lost the internet back in 2012. Oh, wow. Oh, you beat me to it, Peter. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, ah, the good old days. Good article. Yeah. The, that one was one of my favorite how things um, got killed by, uh, but the other one was, um, I have to hunt it down. I think I also have it in here. Um, how AIM got killed. It was like an oral history of AIM, I think was what it was. Um, 
Mm. AIM got bought by AOL, right? No, oh, so AIM was AOL, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what happened to it. This might have predated this archive tool. I wish I knew what happened there because I did some consulting to John Borthwick when he was. So um, AOL bought uh, New, uh, Total New York, which was Borthwick's little startup in New York. And he became an AOL VP. He basically went over the, you know, to Virginia and worked out of the building. And then he hired me for a while because they made him, they put him in charge of all the different buddy list acquisitions. And we were, you know, they bought ICQ, I think. Um, and they had AOL native. And there was another one in the, in the mix. I'm forgetting what it was. Uh, so they were kind of like buddy list central for a while and trying to figure out, should we put a business model on this or whatever? And I don't remember what happened there that much. Um, but then, then that got that space got eaten, I guess, later by Skype, sort of. Another thing that just shot itself in the foot over and over again. Yep, yep. Uh, be, here it is. It was Mashable. This is a great article too. It would be fun to do uh, this. You know, so Paul uh, Roney and I are going to do this um, podcast and i think he's he just sent me a note this morning saying he's finished his uh, fundraising round so he can come out of the underground for a bit um oh thank you jason abrusese um and so this would make a really nice kind of retrospective uh, topic just to talk about the, the graveyard yeah, I mean, there's so many. You could you could spend a literal career just writing about the things Google has killed. <laughs> uh, the, its own products that it's killed off, like in their cribs. Yes, its own products. Are crazy, <laughs> just crazy. Uh, yeah. The to uh, one more reason to do things you can own. Yeah. Uh, I do, uh, you know, I think it's, I do think it's interesting to watch how some of these things take the huge lead and resources they have and just sink them. Just sink them entirely. Billions of dollars, hundreds of people's careers for not. And it's, it's, they just like back and forth. I remember, I wish I remembered who this was now and what company it was, but I remember seeing a little startup show up and they put this gray haired guy in charge. They basically hired in a guy who I had watched kill a couple other companies. And he looked like a CEO. He looked so good in that role and had a famous name because he had like companies that he had done stuff and he was clearly in the old boys club. And then I watched him kill off this little startup. It went no place because I was like, oh, wow, they're doomed. They're doomed from launch because they hired in uh, a, a dude that doesn't really know what he's doing. Yeah, it happens a lot in the media business, too, where there's somebody who looks the part of leadership. Yeah. They hire them and the guy is just a moron and doesn't know what they're doing and screws the company. I mean, it's sometimes like, how do it, it's just... It, it baffles me that very often people who have bankrupted every company they've worked at are considered more qualified than somebody who has, uh, has spent a little less time working as a CEO. Um, it, it, it's, uh, I think I've mentioned this book before, but it, they talk about this in um, Disney War, the book Disney War, where there's like a certain set of executives who believe that being an executive is like a universal skill uh -huh. where it's like, as long as you have been a good executive in one place, then you'd be a good executive in any company doing anything with yeah. oversight over anything. Yeah. And like, it's so like, it doesn't even stand up to basic scrutiny as a conceit. Um, and it just, it was very clear in that book where like, who was it? Eisner yep. loved moving his executives around where somebody who was like, yeah, we turned Disney store into an amazing working company that nobody thought would ever work. And then just take that executive. And now they're in charge of TV programming. Right. And it's a complete failure. And then the person who was 
but there was the person who gets put in charge of Disney store destroys it. Um, it is like such a self-evidently incorrect conceit, but it's still there. I didn't know about Disney more. Thank you. Oh, it's a great book. Uh, that's one of my favorite. Yeah. One of my favorite, I call corporate dramas. Oh, love that. Um, that's a great one. R.J. Nabisco, the story about R.J. Nabisco, Barbarian at the Gates is a great one. Bad Blood is a great one. Yep. Um, there's a whole category of these in my, I am slowly adding to it my Goodreads that is just the most fascinating. Let's see if I can pull that up. No, another Barbarian platform that I would love. To. Oh, RGR, right. Yeah, the first multi, um, like the first greater than a hundred million dollar leveraged buyout. Yep, which is now uh, Mondelez. Who named that? Who had that great idea? God, another baffling idea. Oh, yeah, Mondelez. That's like the Tronk thing, naming themselves, naming themselves Tronk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh God, that was just so bad. This is kind of fun. This is a review of, of business horror stories. Yeah. Uh, oh, here it is. Here's my list of corporate drama. All these are great. Smartest guys in the room. Yeah, that's a, that's a classic one, right? Yeah, that's your. Do I have that on here? I don't think I have it on here. It should uh, the be big, on here. The big short, too big to fail. Yeah, the big room. short's a good one. The big short is, I love the big short. Movie and book. They're just so good. I'm adding a new, right. couple new thoughts in my brain around this. Yeah, that's a good one. I'm going to add that to the list uh, because that's a great book too. Let's see. Disney War. I'm gonna have to add Barbarians at the Gate. I'm gonna have to add your Goodreads list. Flash Boys, right? The Big Short, Disney War, Barbarians again. Fall of the House of Forbes, nice. Conspiracy, super pop. This is a good list. Yeah, I I love. Uh this sort of thing i didn't realize i did and then like after resisting for a long time well because i feel like big short is almost a little different because it's like a general a lot of companies whereas something like disney wars or the fall of the house of forbes is like just one company's insane drama <laughs> um, and it's uh, it's a they're all good but i feel like that is super engaging because you get this window into these people who like the other piece of it is the type of people who do dumb shit in something like Disney or um or RJ Reynolds mm -hmm. or RJR Nabisco, right? Like they have no shame. So mm -hmm. they have no problem being open about all of it. And the and they all hate each other. Um mm -hmm. so they're all like trying to put down for posterity how terrible their mortal enemies are. Right. Uh, which just makes for great reads. <laughs> There's also The Man Who Broke Capitalism about Jack Welch. Ooh, that's a that's a good topic. Um, yeah. The Man Who it Broke Capitalism. Here, I'll give you the title and the a good long title. <clears throat> you know, a good corporate drama um, book uh, subject about one company would be Hewlett Packard. Because it mm -hmm. went from Dave and Bill, um, and when when they died, the board went kind of wacky and killed the whole thing. Yeah, that's another yeah company that just dove itself into the ground full heart. I still am upset about them for what they did to Palm OS. Uh -huh. I, that's a grudge I'll hold forever. I loved Palm OS. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I got to hop, but uh, before I do, I will note in terms of like 
what sort of interesting um, stuff can come out of what we're working on. I do think the interwiki concept is still really good. It's still something that I am working on. It's just I've been delayed by being sick and I um, work priorities that have taken up more of my time than I usually give to work. Um, yeah, so I think like in terms of like what we are intending to produce out initially, I think this is a good one. Um, and of course, the the map of knowledge tools, I think, is another good two good outputs for this group. And I think we have neighboring projects that are like synergistic with those things. So we should just uh, spin them up and, and blend that stuff together and sort of show each other our work and uh, see what's up there. I think that'd be really nice. Um, cool. And then, as I said, uh, Paul and I should be spinning up the podcast now, I think. Um, and I think in particular, these conversations in the Fellowship of the Link are just beautiful sort of background and fodder. And if, if we wanted to launch a, a small series to run under the umbrella of HyperTalk, that would be pretty, pretty awesome. And then we could make this yeah. a little bit dressier and make it into a, a podcast, a series of podcast episodes. Well, mm. I'm always down to try to turn things into podcasts. Before I have to leave, though, um, real quick. Yep. Peter, do you are your is your headset a bone conduction? Headset? Yeah. What is? Do you have a link to where you bought that? Because I really like bone conduction um, stuff, but my problem was always it couldn't be used for calls. It's uh, shocks, and these are the open com one. Um, the, okay. just the regular, the regular ones without a boom mic, um, they work pretty well too. Yeah, I, I had not a shocks one, but a different one, I think, but it was, um, it didn't have the headset. Um, so I, I was always taking it off to use the phone. <laughs> yeah, actually these are great. Um, both the, um, uh, um, you know, both the, the regular ones and the, the boom one, it's really nice and they're, they're beautiful. They just work great. The the Bluetooth is really good. Um, the sound is really good. They sound really good. All right. Cool. Sweet. All right. Well, I got to hop. We'll talk later. Bye. Thanks. Thanks for coming. And uh, I'm thinking if I can figure out how to do it to turn off the recording, and then we can either hang up the call or there we go.